The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal Mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Well, good morning. This morning, I thought we would talk about how we know God. Now, notice I did not say how we know about God, but how we know God. This leads us to a second question, typically. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why is there something rather than nothing? Which is to say, why are we here? Why does creation exist? And what does God have to do with that? We find our grounding to answer that question in the book of Genesis. Genesis meaning in the beginning. You will recall there are two stories of creation in Genesis. The first begins with the uh, let there be leaving open the question, I think, of whether God is actively doing something or allowing something to happen. The second, of course, is a little bit more specific about the creation of Adam, and this is Michelangelo's depiction of that story from the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, right before the spark of life flows from the finger of God to the finger of Adam. How do we know God? I want to talk about a third story, which comes from the mystic Hebrew literature, the mystic Jewish literature, Kabbalah, and it's about Ein Sof, E-I-N-S-O-F, which is the divine being. And what's fascinating about this story is that the way the divine being creates the cosmos is by withdrawing. That is to say, the divine being is everything. And so there's room for something else only if the divine being withdraws. And that's what Ein Sof does. This is a famous depiction of that scene where Ein Sof is withdrawing, allowing space, creating room for something else. Now, why would he do that? One suggestion is that if Ein Sof was everything, all-knowing and all-powerful and all-present. What he didn't have was limitation. And so he created some in order for there to be an other, something for Ainsoft to love. Whatever his motivation may have been, the story goes in three stages. In the first stage, he withdraws, creating space. In the second stage, he then sends down sparks of life into the space that's been created. There are 12 jars that have been created there to contain those sparks. I don't know if that relates to the changing water into wine in the wedding in the, at Cana or not, but there are 12 jars there to contain those sparks of life. But they can't. They are not sufficient to contain the power of that life, those sparks, and so they shatter. They shatter all over this empty space, but in their shattering, each bit contains some of the sparks that were sent into it, and other sparks are left free. Those sparks that are free then return to the Godhead, but the sparks that are in the pieces of jar stay, and the jars are reassembled. The third stage of creation, which is called Tikkun, is the reassembly of those jars. And humanity has some role in that reassembly because the concept in the myth is that the reassembly continues throughout creation. And what humans who also bear this spark of life, but in greater intensity and awareness than other things in the creation, have an affirmative task of helping to reassemble these jars and progress creation. 
And what I love about this myth, of course, is that the spark of life, the part of the Godhead that is in creation, is manifested throughout all of creation, maybe with greater intensity in humanity than in a stone or a tree, but nevertheless in all of creation. I think this is consistent with the Christian concept of the incarnation and a very important fundamental assumption for everything else that I'm going to say about how we come to know God. This brings to mind the Japanese art form that many of you may know about where broken pots are repaired with gold. Do you know this art form? Broken pots are repaired with gold. Here's an example of one, but you can see how beautiful it is, right? More beautiful perhaps than when it was originally created for its brokenness, for its brokenness. This may or may not have been what Leonard Cohen was talking about when he said there's a crack in everything, that's how the light gets in. But whether he knew about the myth of Ainsoft or not, it's the same concept. There's something about that spark of life in the containers which contain it and a beauty in brokenness. When I mention this idea of incarnation, we of course immediately think of Christ and Christ being fully human and fully divine and we're right. But I want to give you another metaphor just to broaden the sense of how complete this idea could be. Heifetz, a 14th century Persian mystic poet, said, I am a hole and a flute that Christ's breath moves through. Can you picture that? I am the hole and the flute through which Christ's breath moves through. In other words, the beautiful music that is being made by this instrument is simply Christ's breath, the divine presence, full being which is then changed in a way by the holes of the flute. Now, what's fascinating to me, of course, is he is a Sufi poet, right? So for him, the difference between Mohammed and Christ is of no great value because what he's talking about is God's presence on earth and the different ways that God's presence may be manifested. But I love that image. I am a hole in a flute that Christ's breath moves through. I have offered you the image of a stained glass window before that God is pure light, the full spectrum of light that when refracted through the colored glass of a stained glass window creates a beautiful image on a stone floor. And that we, in a way, are stained glass windows, right? Refracting God's life in our own unique way, beautiful in our own unique way, yet fundamentally animated by a given life by God. Now, out of this myth of Ain Soft and the three movements that I described, you can also see a pattern that is currently being researched and written about in neurobiology. And I've talked to you about it before, this hemispheric analysis and the mind which is mediated by it. So there is an initial receptivity, there is the creation of that space, a fragmentation and analysis, the breaking down of those jars, and then there is a new synthesis, the reassemble into something is beautiful. But the way I want you to think about it in the concept of how your mind works is that you start in a mode of attending, a way of knowing, right, that has a sense of the whole, where the intuition and the imagination are prominent. Out of that, you have an idea, typically, and it literally gets passed over into your left hemisphere, which I would claim is your self-conscious mind, but for the time being, just think about going to your left hemisphere, where it's processed with greater detail and attention. And then whatever answer is yielded out of that logical analysis gets passed back, or at least should, to the right hemisphere where it's kind of reassembled, if you will, into a new awareness of reality. Now, to get a practical application of that movement into the left hemisphere, think about learning how to play music. 
There's, of course, the symphony, and you have the score, but as you're learning how to play, one of the key elements is to take a part that's hard and just focus on that and figure it out. You're thinking about it, right? Or you're practicing your scales. That's a left hemisphere-dominated activity. You're focused on the mechanics of how to do that, the particular fingering that it requires, the pacing that it requires, all of the details of that. Can you feel that? Do you know what I'm talking about? But when you get that, when you internalize that, then you have to forget it. Because when you go to perform the entire piece, you can't be thinking about where your hands are supposed to be. Or even the timing, right? You are performing. And the minute you start thinking about how well you're performing, you'll screw up. Right? When you talk to, to concert pianists, they'll tell you the very same thing, or professional artists, right? The last thing that you can do is to be thinking about what you're doing. That work needed to be done a long time ago. They're back in a mode where their right hemisphere is dominating when they're performing, and it's literally coming out of them. And when you see a great performer, you can feel that. We have looked before Jacqueline Dupree do a cello concerto where she is just alive with energy. It's my favorite kind of image of the incarnation. But you've seen performers from rock musicians to concert pianists. It's the same thing. Yo-Yo Ma talks very eloquently about this. He said, the minute you have any self-consciousness, you're dead. Right? The minute you have any self-consciousness, you're dead. A more uh, common example might be riding a bike. Right? Remember getting on the bike at some age and somebody's telling you to balance and you're like, what? And so somebody could shout balance at you while you're wobbling along and that is of no help. Right? You've got, you don't even know what balance means in your body. You have to figure that out. I could give you a series of physics equations that describe perfectly what balance means. That would be of no help to you, though the left hemisphere would love it, right? So when you're riding your bike, the last thing you want to be doing is looking down at your feet to figure out what they're doing. You've moved back into a right hemisphere-dominated performance. So this is the movement I want to suggest is how we come to know things. This movement of moving from the whole to a part that we analyze, but then back to the whole. So that one of the risks that we experience, I think, in our current culture is that we've become so good at the analyzing part, we like to stay there. And we have made great discoveries in the analyzing part. It's not that that's a bad thing to do. There's a whole portion, as we discussed last time, of scientific discovery. It may begin with an intuition or some imaginative hypothesis, but ultimately a scientist is trying to validate that it works. That's what the scientific method is all about. That's a very left hemisphere dominated activity. With me? And then you're gonna come out with some theory. But the reality is when you come back to living, right? The reality is when you come back to living. So what you don't want to do is get stuck thinking about stuff, analyzing stuff, trapped in its optimism and control, and in, you need to make that move back into a holistic understanding, an embodied understanding, an in-life understanding. All right, in order to give you some words around that, the self-conscious mind, what I'm calling the left hemisphere mediated way of knowing. To know something is to have it fixed and pinned down. Certainty is your goal. To have power over something is to have the inability to interfere with its operation and manipulate an intended outcome. I'm in control. I have power, right? There's nothing wrong with that. Those are all helpful things. They're just not everything. The point and the self-conscious mind is to gain control. And if you think about how your ego operates in the world, that's exactly what it's doing, right? Projecting your sense of self out into the world, trying to protect itself. 
But the deeper mind, what I'm saying is mediated by the right hemisphere, has a different definition for these terms. So to know something is a process of openness and receptivity. See that difference to know? So it's not fixed. It, you're open to it, which, by the way, is what spiritual practices are all about, opening ourselves to the movement of God in our lives. And when you open yourself and are receptive, then whatever you're focused on, you wind up growing closer to. And the experience of that relationship is what generates the knowledge, is what generates the awareness. So it's personal and it's relational. And to have power over something is to have the ability to allow things to come into being, not to manipulate and control, but to have the power to allow things to come into being. Which, if you think about it, is a lot how we raise our children. What do you want to do to a disobedient child? I want to grab him. I want to hold him up. I want to tell him what it means to be a man, and I want him to do it. Has that ever worked? Not in my life. Certainly not when I was the child. But what do we wind up doing? Setting boundaries to keep the child safe and then making suggestions about how they might grow into themselves and then love them and nurture them while they, in fact, grow up and figure out who they are, right? Which is a constantly changing process. This is what it means to be a parent, I think. Robert, our 11-year-old, broke his arm skiing recently, which he thought got him out of playing baseball. He plays bucket baseball, but we said, no, you're on the team. So you may not be able to play, but you're on the team, so you will be going to practices and you will be going to games. Now, I made a mistake here because I failed to appreciate that if he had to go, I had to go too. <laughs> but putting that aside... He's, he's kind of bought into it, and so the coach asked him to give, they had, they've had a couple of bad games, and so they were trying to come back, and the coach asked him to talk to the team, and so he had written this little speech, and he came to me and he said, you know, what do you think about this speech? And I said, well, do you really want my comments? Right, you always try to reframe as if you want your comments. And I said, this is a great speech, right? But really, you're kind of blaming your team for what they're doing wrong, which he did on three different occasions. They were wonderful things to think about, but they were all stopped doing that. Now, he's parenting what his coach has been telling him, so he's, he's a great kid, but he, the coaches tell him, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Past is past. We're going to have this great season, right? And I said, well, that's all very interesting, but like, if I tell you not to do this, and I gave him an example. I won't tell you what it was, but it was current. <laughs> and I said, if I tell you this, what's your immediate reaction? And without answering my question, he said, oh, you're wrong. I didn't do that anyway. And I said, good. Yeah. So what? Right. You're immediately kind of defending yourself. So what happens if I say you really did a great job of using your right hand to do that and, and not messing with the cast? And he's like, you feel totally different. And then you want to do it. Right. Well, we, we know that to be a appreciative inquiry. But the point is, when he felt attacked and defensive, he went right into that left brain thinking. So it was about control. He was at risk, and he fought back by attacking me. That's just an ego move. But when he wasn't attacked, he would, I would argue, was able to stay more in his right brain and see how all that worked out. And I, I believe that it's getting into the right brain which allows true change in behavior through the encouragement and the sense of what's happening, okay? So whether that makes perfect sense or not, what I really want you to walk away with is as long as we're in that ego-dominated mode of analyzing everything with perfect certainty and feeling at risk, if anybody quarrels with that, that's a different way of knowing it keeps our distance from things and other people and limits what we can ultimately know, right? So we will not ever know God by learning a lot of stuff about God. It can be helpful, but it won't be really knowing God.
We will know God when we get into the deeper mind where the Holy Spirit is actually present, I believe, where we are open and receptive to the movement of the Spirit, and that's where our growth comes from. All right, so these two different ways of knowing are important, and here's a quote from uh, Harry Williams, who uh, wrote in the 60s and 70s. He's an English priest. He says, it does mean abandoning the assumption that the way of knowing used by the scientist in his researches, that's not a typo, however valid in its own sphere, is the only valid way of knowing, right? This was the default that I was talking about before. It's a left brain, left hemisphere, self-conscious mind way of going about things. There's nothing wrong with it, but if we stay there, we miss a lot right? So he says the main characteristic of the other ways of knowing is that they lead to personal union with what is known. They expand the being of the knower so that he becomes fully himself by the felt presence with him of what he knows, right? You know enough to know that union with God has long been considered the ultimate purpose of the Christian life, right? Union with God is what is promised in the resurrection, Union with God is what we're praying for and disciplining ourselves to experience. And Williams is saying that's not going to be available if you're just analyzing everything because you're keeping a distance from it and you're never going to fully know it. If you go back to Ayn Soft, I would argue the world is full of the spark of God's presence and life. And that's a relational, a personal relational understanding that's required in order to fully participate in it. All right. Now we're going to have a little fun, right? At the half hour, dear, it's at the half hour. So, so Oscar Wilde is one of my favorite playwrights. He doesn't have a large canon of work, but it's all brilliant in his kind of way of looking at life. He wrote at the uh, end of the 19th century in London, and he wrote a play called the Ide An Ideal Husband, which in 2018 was made into a movie with these fascinating and wonderful actors. So Kate Blanchett, Minnie Driver, Rupert Everett, Julianne Moore, and Jeremy Northam. And if you haven't seen it, go see it. But, but I am going to spoil it for you because what happens in this play is we start off with two couples fundamentally. So uh, Kate Blanchett is married to uh, Jeremy Northam, and they are very, she is a very proper English lady who's got very concrete and hard and fast rules about what's right and wrong. And her husband is also this politician who carries the same reputation. Early in the, in the play or the movie, we see somebody, a newspaperman saying about him, he's got full of integrity and he stands upright, unlike those politicians in America. <laughs> this is in the 19th century. So, yet it turns out that all of their money actually comes from a canal swindle that he was involved in that he had never told her anything about right, because he's afraid that she won't love him if he reveals who he really is, right? So that's their relationship. And then there's this, uh, Rupert Everett is Lord Goring, who's just this brilliant playboy. His dalliances are all over everywhere, which upsets his dad and thrills all the women. And the, the, the woman who he's closest to is Minnie Driver, who is every bit his equal. And it's worth watching the movie just for their repartee. Okay, but Julian Moore is kind of the temptress. So she and Lord Goring had a, a relationship in the past, but she found a wealthier man, so she dumped him. But she comes rolling into the season in London, and she's got a letter that proves that the politician is a crook. And he is currently going to go speak in Parliament against a canal scheme that is a complete swindle, but which she is heavily invested in. You still with me? So she's saying, I've got this proof that you're a crook, and I'll give you this letter if you speak in favor of this scheme, which makes me a lot of money, and if you don't, I'm going to reveal the letter. 
And then in the midst of the chaos, Kate Blanchett's character, Gertrude, winds up sending a letter to Lord Goring because she's fallen apart and he's her oldest friend and she wants help. And that letter gets caught and intercepted, if you will. And so now these two letters are floating around and these characters have to figure out how to deal with this threat in the midst of these reputations of integrity. So remember, there, what I really want to focus on now is this whole idea of knowing being personal and interpersonal, and that the way we get to know God, but in this case, illustrated by getting to know each other, is by being vulnerable with each other and open and receptive and continuing to learn about the other. And in doing so, of course, we learn about ourselves because we really don't know ourselves until we see it in the face of another. Think about a mother and a young child. How does the young child learn that the child is loved or even exists? I think it's in the face of the mother, whoever the mother happens to be, right? We learn who we are through our relationships with other people is what I'm saying. All right, let's look at a clip or two. This is Gertrude, and that is uh, Julian Moore in the background there. Julian Moore has come to town. She's asked for an audience with Gertrude's husband, Robert. Uh, Gertrude wants nothing to do with it. Right, you see what's happened. So Gertrude has staken her flag in the ground. You're either good or you're bad. If you can commit an indiscretion, that's the end of it. And she's not broken any compromise, and forgiveness is really not in her vocabulary. She sees this threat, and she's reacting sharply to it. All right. So this is Robert, her husband on the left, and Lord Goring in a wonderful so what, did, what does Robert want? Relief. At what cost to himself? Yeah, but is he willing to do any, is he willing to be vulnerable to do that? Is he willing to take any risk or chance? And so what does he know about her? And what does she know about him? He's following the path of least resistance, right? Ever done that? No hands required. Right, she's taken up this position with this abstract principle of integrity, and he's playing a role of somebody he's not. Right? So what do you think he wants more than anything else? I would argue he wants to be fully loved, and specifically by her. But can you be fully loved if you're not fully known? If you're not fully you, yeah. Because if, as long as you're playing a game, somebody may think, they may actually think they love you, but you know it's not you they love, right? It's the image of you that you've put up. It's the face that you've put on. So where does that leave you? Unloved is where that leaves you. So it's always struck me as being kind of interesting, at least in my own life, that I wind up being the thing that's frustrating myself from getting what I mostly want. So there's this constant challenge in life to be open enough, right, to be full of you so that when somebody does, in fact, love you, you feel loved. But you can only do it if you risk being not loved. Does that make sense? So one of the things I think is so powerful about marriage and the covenant of the marriage vows is that you're kind of, among other things, saying, I'm going to be here regardless. And you're not going to get too far into your marriage before you find out things that you didn't expect, I, I suspect, anyway. But the difference between and those of you who suffer through my marriage counseling have heard this already, but the difference between having somebody criticize you when you know they love you and they're not going anywhere and having somebody criticize you when you think the whole relationship is at risk 
is a very different experience. So if you're with somebody who's criticizing you, but you know they love you and they're not going anywhere, it's more like telling Robert he's doing a great job with his right arm. You're like, oh, I didn't realize about that myself. Or, yeah, I wish I wouldn't do that. Or, oh my God, did I do that again? And even if, no matter what it is, right, you've got a, an avenue to integrate it into who you are, to reconcile the parts of you that you've been living with. This is exactly what Kathy's talking about in her sermon when she talks about Easter and fully redemption, full redemption and the resurrection all being redeemed. That those parts of you, the Good Friday parts and the Easter day parts, can be brought together in the love of God. That is the promise of the love of God. That is the promise of the incarnation. But we often need a partner to coax us into believing that. Right, Because you have to trust that there's a tomorrow before you're going to take a risk with today. Does that make sense? So I think marriage is a great way to kind of see how this all works, but the dynamic is the same. And what we're ultimately claiming is that God's love is always there, never to be withdrawn. But knowing God means trusting that. So all of the ways that we stiff-arm God because of the demands that that love makes of us. I'm saying it's always there. I'm not saying you don't have to change, right? If you're going to fully accept the love of God, then you can't be all wrapped up in your ego, only projecting yourself into the world. You've got to be open to it and change in accordance with it. If you really believe the spirit is in the room and capable of moving, then you have to be willing to create space for that spirit to move without knowing how you're going to be impacted by it. Right, Real leadership is being focused on the common good and the outcome and not on how you're going to look when it comes about. Those are all ways that we step back from our egocentristic postures. And it ain't easy. And it isn't supposed to be easy. If it was easy, we wouldn't need to come to church. So... I'm looking at it in the context of relationship because at least in my life, that's where it's been most profound. But I want you to hear me say, I just think that's how the world works and how we make our way through the world and why it's important to know God. Right, when Jesus is baptized right at the beginning of his ministry and he goes to John and he's baptized in the water and, and the dove descends, and what does God say? This is my son in whom I am my translation, delighted, right? There's an essence to Jesus, which is God, that Jesus is never going to lose. That doesn't mean he has to pay attention to it, I would argue. He just, thank God, does. And that's what the temptations are. His spirit drags him into the wilderness so that he can be tempted. And what are the temptations? They're the same things we have today, basically, right? Achievement possessions, admiration of others. Like, it's, it's an old story. <laughs> it's an old story. And he resists all of that, remaining open to God. Okay. This is a great scene. This is Minnie Driver at one end of this long hallway. Remember, she and Lord Goring have been just kind of sparring in this wonderful way throughout this play. And she's heard that he is engaged to be married, and she is not happy. Worth the whole movie. To look at a thing is not the same thing as seeing a thing. You haven't seen a thing until you've seen its beauty. Back to our creation myth with the spark of the divine in everyone. Or to our baptismal covenant where we say we respect the dignity of every human being. We tend to think of that not in a romantic context, but one of social justice. But, you know, res what respect means is look again. Look again. So one way to read that portion of the baptismal covenant is you keep looking until you find the dignity in that person. Not pretend that it's there. Not just treat them with kindness. But you continue to be attentive to them, to be open to them, to be receptive to them until you find the dignity in them, the beauty in them.
that's a much different ethical prescription, right? I've told you before, in our house, we have this um, practice called charitable reading. And the practice, as I describe it, is you have to find three reasonable motivations for the stupid thing the other person just did. And it's not limited to your spouse or children, just in the world, right? What might that person have been thinking to lead them to this wrong-headed conclusion that makes me want to kill them? You might analogize it to Jesus writing in the dust when they wanted to stone the adulterous woman. It's like, why don't y'all calm down a minute? But I was talking about this the other day, and, um, and, and Mary Hunter said, you know, George, I don't think you quite have this right. And I thought, oh, Lord, here it comes. She said, it's not just an exercise that you do for you. It's an exercise you do to see them. And I hate when she does that. <laughs> but do you see the difference? It's not just an exercise I do so I don't become a jerk right away. It's an exercise that I do to be open to and receptive to them, trusting that there actually is a divine spark in them, trusting the Holy Spirit actually does reside in them, trusting that they too are children of God, which is not at the top of my mind at the moment, right? This is a different way of knowing, a personal way of knowing, an inter interpersonal way of knowing that when we're open and receptive to the presence of God yields us into a deeper knowledge of each other and I would argue the world. All right, well, we are in fact gonna reconcile some of this and Lord Goring is in fact gonna take many drivers' admonitions to heart. You will remember, of course, that many driver is the same kind of voice of wisdom that um, we saw in Goodwill Hunting, right? Where she is offering advice there and letting the protagonist do what he needs to do. All right, here we're back with Robert and Gertrude. She's got a letter that, um, that she's intercepted and she's mad at him. And what's not shown, because we didn't have time, is that all the other people make up these outrageous lies to explain the presence of this letter. And she finally gets sucked into it and lies herself. And this, it's a wonderful scene where she's just ultimately kind of breaking her own rule, right? But it's after that that there's this other letter, and he thinks it's all over, and this is what she says. Finally getting what he never thought he would get when he took the risk of being himself, or at least being honest about himself. And that leads us to the final scene where Minnie Driver, the, in my view, keeper of wisdom here, Wisdom being distinguished from factual knowledge, of course. And um, I'm just going to play it. A great image for reconciliation, right, and redemption. This idea that what love means is the nurture of the other person to be who they are, not who you want them to be or who their father wants them to be right? And that commitment then carries them forth, but she's the one that taught that to him, I think. And the kind of key point was looking and seeing are different things. So John McMurray, who's a Scottish philosopher who gave these famous lectures back in the 50s, says, all meaningful knowledge is for the sake of action and all meaningful action for the sake of friendship which is to say our direction always in knowing is relationship. And the way we know, whether it's our wife or a friend or a tree or a science experiment is to observe and be open to and notice what that other thing is in a charitable way, in a respectful way. And it is in that openness and receptivity that we become different people as we know not only who we are, but I would argue who God is. You know, God still being the animating force that made all this happen and is present not only in everything, but beyond everything. And so when we are seeing the beauty in another person, what we are really doing is allowing the God in us to connect with the God in them. <laughs> 
which changes both of us, which is exactly what's happened here. And finally, you will remember a comment at the end of our last class. Was it Wordsworth? Who was it? Wordsworth says, you have to kill the frog to dissect the frog, right? Which is not the most glorious proclamation of the nature of humanity, but that, I would argue, is that way of attending, which is all about control and getting to the bottom of things and putting it out. And I've argued that that's necessary, but we really need to be ultimately in another way of knowing. And I'm going to describe that other way of knowing as you have to love a frog to dissect him. You won't know the frog with the scalpel on the table. You will know the frog by paying attention to the frog. Annie Dillard, a wonderful writer, has a great example of this, I think, in Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, where she talks about the muskrats. She wanted to know about the muskrats, but she could never see them because as she approached, they would scurry away. So one day she goes out and she stands on the bridge where she can see the muskrats, and she stands there. And she doesn't move, and she doesn't talk. She just stands there. And slowly, as her presence becomes part of the surroundings, the muskrats come out of where they are and literally present themselves to her. And she's able to be in the same world that they inhabit. And she's learning about them as she has made herself open and receptive to the muskrats which to my way of thinking is a wonderful image of the contemplative life, right? She has taken her ego and she's put it in her lunchbox. And by virtue of being open to the muskrats is now in relationship with the muskrats. It is that posture that I think we are called to take throughout our lives and all of our relationships because all real knowledge is in fact personal and relational. That's what McMurray is saying. That's what that creation myth is saying. That's what the incarnation, the doctrine of the incarnation is saying. And we need to use that analytical mode of attending, but we need to wind up, have that be in service of the larger engaged relational knowledge. All right. So I have a minute for questions if you have any. The three things out of the myth, you mean? Oh, oh, the charitable reading, three reasons. Yeah, well, I think three just comes out of like the Marine Field Manual or something. Isn't there something Marines have to come up with different suggestions? Never mind, you don't have to answer that. So what three things? You know, what context is that person coming out of? Did that person come out of a different evangelical context so their whole conception of God is something that, you know, has been drilled into them for years and that's what they're working out? What, what is being threatened in that person by something you just did that you didn't even know you did? You know, you walk through the world in a certain way, that's threatening to people you don't even realize. Who is their authority? Who is their guide that they're listening to that they perhaps incorrectly, but nevertheless have just assumed just telling the full truth? When in fact it's not. There'd be three kind of categories of things. Um, yeah. No, I heard the question. I just avoided it. I don't have one right away. It's a good question, though. Yeah. said back to the relating what you've just said back to uh, the original title here about knowing God how do you know God uh, I mean a simplistic statement is to be you have to be open and receptive uh, what would you say beyond that I mean it in my mind you have to love God with your your head and your heart you know and when in our confession we say you know I have not loved you with my whole heart because we never fully know God I guess. I, I mean, what, 
Can you respond to that? I can. So the question is, how do you know God? Just all these kind of encouragements to do something. And I would say that the primary way to God is to get, is to stop doing things. God, my assumptions are God is present, God is active, God is good. So if I stop getting in his way, he will make himself known to me, and all I have to do is accept it. So there's a lot to be done, but it's not about earning or meriting or finding God. We talk about people seeking God, but the truth is you just need to stop getting in the way yourself which is the same thing going on in these relationships, right? When you stop with the secret, when you stop with the manipulation, when you stop with the hiding, then there's a relationship there or, or not. But our belief in God is that it's always true. So we're not there with the whole heart because our ego's gotten in the way and we're trying to control when and how, even when we pray, right? God, I, have, I, I know what I want, God do this. And when God doesn't do this, then I'm unhappy right? As opposed to being open to an unimaginable future, which would be real trust in God. So I think it's to stop doing things, stop covering God's up. Yeah. And, and, you know, this is kind of this whole thing is the big guy must die. The, you know, the big guy must die. The big as in, must die. Yeah. Oh, the big I. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Well, we talk in our before about dying before you die. How do, you, how do you lose your ego and your reliance upon your ego before you've lost your body? And again, I think intimate relationships are often the place where that happens, where you have enough trust and confidence to risk not being in control and find out that there's a whole new life there, right? There's a whole new life there. Sadly, it's not a place we ever get to. I think it's just a thing we do. So hopefully we are deepening our relationship with God, i.e. allowing God's presence to consume us throughout our lives. But I like the big eye must die, yes. Other thoughts? Lucy? Can we change the subject a little? A little. Oscar Wilde was uh, very ill. I mean, excuse me. Oscar Wilde went to the theater, and there he became very ill. He was carried across the street to a boarding house. This is the truth. Yeah. And he was laying on a couch, and he looked at the wallpaper, which was very colorful cabbage roses, and he said, one of us has to go, and he died. <laughs> <laughs> he was a clever man, Oscar Wilde. Um, but his, in, his insight in unmasking the games we play is why his writing is so brilliant and so spiritually helpful. Because if I believe that if we become aware of what we're doing, back to your question, John, if we, the more we become aware of what we're doing, often that's enough. If I'm aware that I'm acting that way, I often will stop. I mean, a deep awareness, right, of how that's not me. I'll just stop. Whereas if somebody just tells me to stop, then I'm just going to find a way to hide it from them. So I think awareness is the root of our spiritual growth. All right, any compelling questions before we go? Tough bar there. Okay, let's stand and say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.